In this lecture, we will discuss power screws and their usefulness in mechanical design. When we think about what a screw is, at the end of the day, a thread is nothing more but an inclined plane or a ramp. And as we have this standard thread form shown, let's discuss the components. First, there's the concept of a pitch, and the pitch is the distance between two threads. And the pitch is not the same as a lead. The lead is the amount of rise that would occur for an object resting on one of the uh, inclined planes as it turned 360 degrees. For a great number of threads, the pitch is equal to the lead. So in this case, this thread is attached to the next thread. Matter of fact, there's really only one inclined plane for the entire screw. So it wraps around and then comes on the back side. It would start here. They do make what's what are called multiple start threads in which you might have two, three, or even four starts four different threads so that when the screw is twisted 360 degrees, an object resting on this inclined plane would actually go up not one but four in the case of a four start thread. Um, so the, the lead is equal to the pitch times the number of starts. Also on this slide we can see that the diameter, the pitch diameter is a theoretical value that's somewhere between the major diameter, which is the outside, and the mi minor diameter, which is at the root of the thread. Notice the minor diameter is distinguished as D sub R, standing for the root of the thread. We also notice that there is a crest that no, does not come to a complete point, and there is a root that also does not come to a complete point. This is done um, for some reasons, because of manufacturing, it's difficult to manufacture all the way down to a sharp corner. And also for use, we really wouldn't want the crest, for instance, to come all the way to a point that would make the screw sharp and not so easy to use. Um, and then the final, for a standard thread form, the angle between the threads is 60 degrees. Matter of fact, if we're going to cut this thread, we might use a, a tool like a lathe, and we would have a 60 degree tool cutter that would be inserted into this and then moved as the shaft was twisted. That's how we would create our thread form. So those are some basic notations of a thread. When we use threads to drive, they're doing one of two things. One thing is power transmission. So we're either taking rotational energy to linear or we're taking linear rotation to translational. So for instance, a car jack. I'll show a picture of one in just a minute, but as you twist the handle, you're applying a torque. So you're applying, applying rotational work. And what you want it to do is you want it to achieve linear work. You want to raise the car off of, off of the ground. The other thing that you might would be doing besides power transmission would be some sort of accurate locating. This is very often done with servo motors. So you have some sort of actu actuator that moves linearly as a motor is twisted. So almost all, if not all, CNC machines use these sort of power threads as their working mechanisms under the scenes for causing accurate location. We also use it a lot with robotics and in a great deal of the manufacturing equipment. So it turns out if we're going to use an inclined plane to transmit power, the 60 degree cutout turn, uh, is inefficient. We'll, we'll take a look at some of the math later, but um, the one that is the most efficient is a square thread. It has a great deal of efficiency. It's also extremely strong. The problem is creating tools to make this shape is difficult. So a square thread is the most efficient but the hardest to manufacture. Early on it was discovered a good compromise. This is an Acme thread. An Acme thread is much easier to manufacture than a square thread. And it's defined as having 14 and a half degrees angle. That compares uh, the last screen we saw that the standard thread form is 60 degrees, the Acme th thread form is 29 degrees. One of the advantages of the Acme thread is as the nut wears out, the nut would sit in this gap right here, and as it begins to wear out and get thinner, you can actually tighten it up and it would continue to hold, and so that can be used as an item that wears while your Acme thread does not, and it makes change out and replacement easier. 
There are also several different flavors of Acme threads. So for instance, you can have a stub Acme in which the top of the thread is kind of cut off to make it shorter, more, more fat. You can have left and right handed threads. And you can again have multiple starts, one, two, three, or even four start Acme threads. The other type of power screw that I'll mention briefly is a buttress thread. If you notice, the buttress thread is somewhat taking the advantage of both the Acme and the square thread. On one direction, it's nearly square, and so it, it can handle a great deal of load when we'll call that raising the load, going against the load. So it's useful for unidirectional loads, but it, it is very inefficient for lowering the load. So it's really only good for moving in one direction. So the picture on the right shows an example of a power, a power screw. This is an Acme thread power jack. The way this is going to operate is you're going to grab hold of the handle and you're going to apply a torque on this nut. And as you twist the nut around, it's going to force the screw to rise against the load. That's what we're going to call up. And then if we go the other direction, it'll lower the screw or going the same direction as the load. That's what we're going to call down. Notice, although in this case we would be thinking about it as maybe lifting a car or a house, and so we would we would recognize that this is that gravity is this downward direction. The definition of up and down has to do with whether the load is um, the vector of the load is in the direction that we're going. If it is, that's considered down. And if the vector of the load is reversed to the direction that the screw is moving, we'll consider that up or raising the load. Also notice that there's sliding happening in two different locations. One of the locations is actually in the threads. So there's sliding going on between the thread of the nut and the thread of the screw. The other place that there's friction happening is between the collar or the nut and the housing. And so in this particular case, a ball bearing thrust bearing has been applied to this scenario to allow the nut to slide freely as it, as it translates rotationally with the torque. We'll discuss the effect of the friction of the collar on the housing as well as the friction of the thread in the nut. So let's take a look at the analysis of the force. So what we want to do is we want to unwrap 360 degrees of our screw and then we're going to imagine that the load is being applied onto that screw as a force. And so this picture shows the screw being unwrapped. As a matter of you can see that the, the distance that we've gone straight here is the circumference of the pitch diameter, so pi times the pitch diameter, and the amount of the inclined plane that we're trying to raise it is going to be called L, that's the lead. As we discussed before, the lead is equal to the pitch times the number of starts. P is the load that we're trying to lift, F is the force that we're generating because of the torque that we're applying, and this F is the frictional force that's opposed to it. N is the normal force that keeps everything, um, and N is going to be a combination of the torque applied and P. I also want to note that this angle lambda is defined by definition. The tangent of lambda is equal to the lead divided by pi times the pitch diameter. And so we can express the force as being equal to the normal force times the coefficient of friction and cosine of alpha plus the sine of alpha. The normal force can be defined as a function of the P that's being of the force being applied. And combining those two together, you get the force that's being applied to that block, the pink block being shown on the on the screw. If we want to calculate the torque, what we're going to do is take that force and multiply it by the radius, which is the pitch diameter divided by 2. The torque in the screw, as you move the screw up, is equal to the load you're lifting times the pitch diameter divided by 2, multiplied a co by a coefficient of friction times pi times the pitch diameter plus the lead, divided by pi times the pitch di diameter minus a coefficient of friction times the lead. There is a torque that's occurring at the thrust collar because of friction. It's going to be equal to the coefficient of friction between the collar and the housing times the load that's resting on it times the average radius, which we'll call the diameter of the collar over 2. 
So the total force needed to lift the load is equal to the screw in the up direction plus the, the so this is the torque caused by the screw in the up direction and this is the torque caused by the collar. The two of them together combine the total amount of torque necessary to raise the load. To lower the load, what we're doing is we're switching the sign. There's a minus here and a plus instead of a plus and a minus. And this is because the force caused by the torque is now operating in a different direction to lower the load. Notice to lower the load, P is actually aiding the slide down, whereas to raise the load, P is opposing the slide down. It's opposing the torque that we're putting into it. For Acme threads, we're still going to have the same equation of, of torque on the collar. Nothing changes. But if you notice, there's now a new angle. Matter of fact, the, the equation I'm going to show is not just for Acme threads, but for any that are on an angle. And if you notice, that angle is this alpha. So we still have our lambda, which has to do with the lead. But now we also have the shape, whereas before it was square, now it's not square. So the new term for an Acme thread alpha is always equal to 14.5. But in general, we'll keep alpha in the equation. And the torque up equation now looks like this. And notice you have a cosine of alpha. In the case of a square thread, alpha would be equal to 0. The cosine of 0 is equal to 1. And this equation actually decomposes back into the one that we just were solving. So this, this equation is accurate for any thread that has an, an angle of alpha. So torque up and also torque down works the same way. The next question is whether these terms can be negative. A lot of times when you think about what would be dangerous for a jack, for instance, is how much load can you put on the jack before the, how heavy would the car have to be for the jack to start down? And something to notice here is if this term is a positive number, notice you've got a friction term, um, this is the diameter of the thread, these are all ge geometry dimensions, none of this has anything to do with the load. If this term right here is a positive number, no matter how big P gets, it doesn't matter how heavy the load is, the torque will not allow this to descend. So it should make sense that there's you, you can't build a thread so that it automatically raises. If it is, then you're creating energy somehow, and that, that doesn't work. But for the torque going down, it's this term right here that's going to determine whether or not it's possible for the torque to be negative. If the torque is negative, that simply means that it's going to require torque to keep it from moving, as opposed to requiring torque to make it move. Both allowing it to move and making it stay still are both um, occasionally desired. So for instance, sometimes we want it to be self-locking. When I, when I use a, a power screw to raise a car so that I can get underneath it and, and work on the car, I don't want to let go of it and have to be wondering whether or not the car is going to lower the jack. So in the case of a jack, we definitely desire self-locking. It is a great thing for that term to stay positive. That way I know it'll never come down. There are other times, so very often we, in feedback loops, we, we will grab hold of an end effector and move it around with a robotics, robotic arm. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how much the motor turned, and that'll tell us uh, what type of input we want to do. So, so in robotics, we have examples where we want to be able to make a linear motion and translate it back into rotational. And that's what we call back drivable. So back drivable and self-locking are mutually exclusive concepts. So how do we decide if something is self-locking? Let's take a look at this equation again. Again, the terms in bold are what determine whether it's self-locking. And so we're going to make a criteria. We're going to say that our power screw is self-locking if the coefficient of friction is greater than the lead over pi times the, uh, the pitch diameter times the cosine of alpha which is also equal to tangent of lambda times cosine of alpha. So notice what we have here. We have a coefficient of friction term. And all of this is geometry. So what are the types of friction values that we typically see? For oil lubricated thread and nut combinations, so metal on metal grinding, but oil present, we typically see a coefficient of friction somewhere about around 0.15, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.2. And in general, again, if you have oil lubricated nuts on, a, on some sort of housing, the collar friction will be roughly equivalent to the friction in the thread. 
Often we're going to want to put roller element thrust bearings as the picture showed earlier in the slides. And when we do that, or we decrease the amount of friction by a, a order of magnitude. So going from 0.1 to 0.2, now we're going to 0.01 to 0.02. We can also use roller element bearings in the threads themselves. So this is called a ball screw. And if you notice the shape of the screw, it's, it's designed to hold ball bearings. And as the nut is turned, the balls move down to the end of the line, and then they come back through a return tube and are recycled. It's a clever way to allow us to have a roller element power screw. So what does efficiency look like? When we talk about efficiency, the general equation is work out divided by work at in. If the work out is equal to the work in, we have 100% efficiency. That typically doesn't, isn't the case, or is never the case, and it's definitely not in the case of power screws. So our work out is actually com is how much the load is being raised. So how much the, is the load raised? It's going to be equal to P, the load value, times L, the lead. That's how much we raised it over 360 degrees. The work in is the amount of torque we're applying. And so that same 360 degrees rotation is 2 pi radians. And so the input work would be torque times 2 pi. So this is our equation for what the efficiency would be for a power screw. Now we can make some assumptions and, and, and kind of dive into this a little bit deeper. If we use square threads and if we neglect the effect of collar friction, the, equation, the efficiency equation decomposes into just being a function of two things, lambda and the frictional values. Another way that might be common for finding the efficiency, again, this is neglecting the collar friction. But if we assume that our coefficient of friction of 0.15 and we're using standard Acme threads, the coefficient of friction can be or the efficiency can be calculated and is actually listed in tables. While this graph is up, there's one more observation I'd like to make. Notice the Acme threads come in standard sizes. So for instance, the smallest size listed on this table is a quarter of an inch diameter. That would be the outside diameter. You should be able to take a pair of calibers and put it on there, and you would measure a quarter of an inch. And it's going to have 16 threads per inch. So that's how, what this notation looks like. The outside or the major diameter and the number of threads per inch. So we start with a quarter 16. And if you notice down here, for instance, a 4 inch would have 2 threads per inch.